originating from the podcast studio inside FAM 360's headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. This is the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast. The Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast is designed to encourage, equip, and inspire our audience through a combination of inspirational stories and real life experiences shared by other successful and skilled leaders in a variety of occasions. We hope that the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast empowers each one of us to step out, step up, and ultimately thrive as leaders. Now here's our host, Mr. Matt Maloney. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Matt Maloney. Today, we get to continue the conversation with my good friend, Alex Gu. Last episode, we learned a lot about Alex, uh, where he came, where he was you know, raised, uh, his business that he um, was really thrust into, where, and then he was eventually thrust into a leadership role. We get to learn about, uh, or we learned about some of the things that um, he learned along that journey from some of his mentors, some of his business partners. So I'd like to pick the conversation. Well, first of all, welcome back. Hey, good to be here. Yes, sir. Go. Um, so I think I want to pick up the conversation because we didn't hear, you know, you started building this great company huddle or you, you started leading this great company huddle with your other partners, continuing to build it. What happened to huddle? Yeah. Uh, is it still around? What happened? Yeah, well, it's still around in a little bit of a different capacity, but so we acquired it in 2010 and then, uh, Late, like oh my, might as well call it 2017. We had kind of scaled it and um, and went from what we call analog to digital. So it went from paper tickets that we were given high schools to basically becoming the ticket master of high schools, but through a digital platform that we named GoFan. And when we did that, it just it just started scaling and. Uh, we just kind of grew beyond ourselves. So we sold it um, to a private equity firm. Uh, then it was called Buckhead Investment Partners. It's now Panoramic. Um, worked there for two years. And um, in 2000, I guess that would have been 18, 19, started my new company, Click Partnerships. And then GoFan has subsequently sold again, sold again. Right? again. Yeah. yeah, to a big KKR, a, a really big private equity, equity firm. firm. Yeah. 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 Wow. So. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And and that's not every journey uh, or every leader's journey and every business's journey where they sell the private equity and then, uh, you know, sell again. What was it like? Just curious. What was it like in those short few years that you've continued to work with huddle? Yeah. GoFan, if you will, or the product was GoFan, but what was that like that it was no longer, well, it still was yours, but it was no longer yeah. yours. Was that a different experience? It was. I mean, I think that was, you know, everyone, and we talked a lot about in preparation for that, like, what's it like when private equity acquires you? And everything we heard was, they, it's all about the money, period, and your soul was lost. And so we came in expecting that. Um, so I would tell you in, in some ways that was true, but it wasn't what BIP, Bucket Investment Partners kind of did necessarily. It's just the nature of it, right? Sure. They did everything they said they were going to do, but, but the culture inevitably changed, yeah. right? And it wasn't ours, even though it was, and which is exactly, I mean, we sold and we knew what we were getting into and it was the hardest decision I've ever made. We've ever made, um, in our lives, but it happened and it was a good two years, but it was, I was ready to be done. And probably, sure. I think most folks who do end up selling the private equity have a similar experience. Yeah. You know, yeah, I did. You don't know it until you know it. Yeah. You, you don't know. know. Right. I mean, yeah. But, yeah. And, and so, but it, but that two year period allowed you to obviously continue to scale the business and then you left. Yeah. How long did you sit idle before you started your new business? I Click. did, and that's just not that's not who I am. You mentioned, I think on a previous podcast, I'm a grinder. I mean, that's just who I am. I'm, i I work. I love to work. Yeah. Um, and so we, I started Click. I had a relationship, have a relationship with um, with the the guy who handles all partnerships, sponsorships, partnerships, marketing with Hershen Family Entertainment. Hershen is a parent company for like Dollywood and yes. Harlem Globetrotters oh, yeah. and a bunch of other yep. properties. They're headquartered here in Peach Street, not too far from this from from here, the studio. He he was a one man show and said, "Man, I need some help selling." partnerships um across the country we have 20 some properties can you can you help i'll i'll pay you a retainer and and some commission and i said yeah because i'm not i I wasn't interested in working for a company i think that's one thing you know when you start something you just kind of but if you want to hire my company i'll 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 support you and i was just thinking it 
it'd be a bridge to the next thing. Sure. So and that was really that that was really how you sprung board the launch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it and it cash flowed from the beginning. So it was like um it wasn't super risky. I'm fine to take risk. I'm I'm not risk averse at all. But this this did offer a kind of a nice uh pathway landing strip to, mm-hmm. to, to kind of jump off one and and it has just scaled like crazy and we've gone in from the click has has gone from uh, a lot of theme parks zoos aquariums attractions representing them from a sponsorship standpoint which is, and now we're doing a lot of uh, venues music venues like I mentioned the Fox Theater, yeah. Randall Opry, Austin City Limits. You know, wow. Some different places like that. That's cool. so it's and, been awesome. And, and is this business model unique to them? And, and uh, what you're bringing to them, is it somewhat unique? Because it sounds like, uh, and we talked a little bit about this, but it yeah. sounds like it was kind of a regurgitation or a reinvention, but you, you know, as you said before, I don't invent it. I take what's yeah. been invented and make it better. Yeah. And it sounds like kind of the model that was in the sports marketing world and, and what you did moving over into this entertainment world. Is that essentially? Yeah. So sp- the sports marketing space is, is uh, for years since I mentioned host communications back in the, in the 1990s, early 80s, uh, colleges and pro sports a lot of times would outsource their sales and, and marketing efforts that that really hasn't been done a ton on the entertainment side and when i say entertainment attractions uh, you know venues mm-hmm. um, and there's just a niche in there not everyone but there's enough to where and, and we have a little bit of a we have a good story to tell now so it's just grown and it's been it's been awesome and i'm i'm loving it i'm We'll see where it goes, but I'm really enjoying it. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur now, right? Yeah, I guess. You, yeah. you said it. You can't, it's, it's hard to go back <laughs> and you've got that creative, you got that creative juice flowing again. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty exciting. All right. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. And I think the audience will benefit from knowing a little bit about your family, your personal family. You talked on the last episode about where you grew up and your, your parents, your mom, your dad, um, just how they spoke into your life. But Let's talk about your family, your wife, your kids. Yeah. So, uh, Angie met Angie. Uh, we've been married. It'll be 23 years in December. I think, oh gosh, that's awful. I, I think it's 23. Yeah. <laughs> you better know that. Uh, I better know that. Um, but no, it's been great and it keeps getting better, you know, which has been, a, it's been awesome. Um, but we met, um, when we were, I was a freshman. She was a sophomore in college and um, kind of got married young in life. And here we are. And um, the second year of our marriage, we had we had just always prayed and prayed uh, for twins. And um, we knew we weren't going to be able to have biological kids. That's just kind of part of our story and yeah. start praying for twins. And, and well, Angie started praying. She said, why don't you start doing it? And I'm like, yeah. Oh. I'll throw a couple up there, but the likelihood of it's just hard. It's hard, hard to adopt one baby yeah. in America, let yeah. alone. Well, God graced us with two uh, boy girl twins, and I guess that would have been two thousand two, uh, wow. Beckett and Bella, and they're um, they're now twenty in in college, and uh, both of them Amazing. respectively. One's at Marshall, where I went. Yep. My daughter's at Troop McConnell. And then Gracie and Laney are our little girls. Little. They're uh, six and seven grades. They're, 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 they're growing. <laughs> they are. And they're they're just they're just real blessings. And, uh, you know, we, this is a great season of life right now. We're, we're getting ready for that middle school. I mean, we're right in there. But it's, it's, it's different. It's coming, baby. It's so different. It's it. different. I mean, I'm a little bit ahead of you in that I've got, you know, transitioning into high school and late middle school. So with, with Mallory and Maggie. Yeah. So speaking of uh, your family and starting a new business, Click, now that's, what, four years old-ish, four and a half years old, how do you, as, you know, now a entrepreneur or again, entrepreneur running this business, smaller business that's scaling pretty quickly. How do you balance work, you know, work life and family life? Yeah. I mean, and that was a big thing when we were, so, it's, it's ages and stages, right? I mean, oh, yeah. we were, um, in the huddle days, there's probably a little less of me to, to go around. Angie would, would pick up a lot of the slack. I mean, she would over, over extend, um, and learning, learning through that, that's probably not the, the best <laughs> for, for longevity's sake and a healthy marriage yeah. and being a great dad. I mean, those were not consistent, you know? Yeah. So I think, um, what, when, when we launched the new company, part of that was 
what kind of the life balance, you mm-hmm. know, and, and the, I'm super fortunate because a lot of what I'm doing, I'm loving and what we do, you know, it's in the entertainment space. So a lot, I can, I can take Angie and the kids and do, they can do fun stuff while I go on the, on my sales trips or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, you come, you get to combine them together. Yeah, I do. And uh, Listen, and COVID I, may have changed a lot of it too, right? I mean, two years into you launching Click, yep. COVID hits, everything goes remote for 12, 14, 18, whatever, you know, whatever it is, but we're two and a half years into it now, roughly. And so uh, you were, you know, you were kind of forced to work, you know, in the home or near the home, even if whether you wanted to or not, when you, when you launched it. So maybe in some cases that's helped. And and I'll talk maybe in a minute about how I've read a lot of statistics now where that's hurting that work-life balance because of the burnout that's happening because, you know, work just stays in the home and then just continues. And there's not this kind of clean break where it used to be, Hey, I go into the office. Well, and that's still the case, but, but not as much as it was. I read a statistic this morning, two thirds of all people are working from home right now Mm. in certain, you know, certain industries. Now that may not be, you know, nationally or globally, I should say, but in the U S that's the case, which is pretty crazy. Think about that. It really is. And I've, I, that a couple things on that, um, you ask how I remember my mom all growing up, praying that we would love her boys would love what they do for work. They would just love it. My dad was going through a, a job that he didn't love and we saw that coming home. And so I think part of that is like, I love what I do. And I, I kind of followed a career that based on my mom's prayer and hearing her say that, that I, I wanted to do it. So part of the work life balance that you alluded to is, I mean, I'm really blessed to love what I do, right? Mm. People who I'm doing it with. So, um, so, so that's part of it, and including my family in it. I think getting back to what you were saying, though, about the being at home, I never thought I could be in a home setting, and I, I work a lot out of the house right now, but I am really convicted. Angie and I talked about this last night about I want – and this could be wrong. I mean, I, but I want, I want my kids to see me – to honestly, some not see me sometimes. I, they right. need to know I'm out working. I'm not in the house, right, even sure. if I'm in my office and doing whatever. I almost want them, at least in their mind's eye, to see I'm out hustling. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Yes. So I do think, and we're we're working on that right now. Like, what are we going to do? Are we going to get an office outside of home for yeah. really for that reason? I want them to experience my work outside of the house too. Sure, come and. You know, yeah, come. Part of yeah, absolutely. And 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 I will tell you that in my personal life, and and when we were kind of thrust into going remote, and and you know all the things that we had to go through, there there are times where there's been some comfort in me working remote and at home. But actually, what I've learned is that it's more of it creates more friction in my home because my kids see me there, my kids come to me and expect and, and, and want me to be a dad and say, hey, dad, can you come help me with this? Can you come do that? And, and I'm in the middle of, I've got 45 minutes that I've got to get a bid proposal out. I'm working with my sales team. We're about to do a call and say, I can't do that. But they're seeing me physically there. So they're expecting me to be dad at home. And so I've learned, and Megan and I have talked a lot about this. And, and she seriously, and maybe sometimes jokingly, is like, I need you out of the house because it's actually healthier for our family for you to work outside of the house. And it's healthier for me too, because then I can come in the house and and keep the sanctity of the family relationship separate from what is, you know, going on at work because much like you, I'm, I'm a grinder. And if, and I'm, if I'm not careful, I won't turn it off. I mean, I'll take little breaks, 45 minutes and within 45 minutes. And next thing you know, and it's eight o'clock at night, my mind is wandering back to, Ooh, I need to go tackle this, go back into my office. The next thing I know it's 10 at my house. The next thing I know it's 10 o'clock at night and that's bad for me. Well, it makes me think of two things. I'll say that. Like I remember Andy Stanley talking about his dad, Charles, who's a very famous, everyone wanted a piece of his dad. growing yeah, up, Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he knew he could always knock on his office door at church and Andy gets priority. Yeah. Well, and I, and I thought, man, that is big. And I want my kids to have that too. The reality is when you're at home a hundred percent of the time and you've got bids due and you've got the, that they, they aren't 
the priority at that point. Right. At that and, moment, at and, that moment right. in time. And when you're at work, you can kind of distinguish the two if you're off site. So there's, there's a, a challenge there because I want my kids to always know yeah. you're number one, but when you're in the middle of a call, you know, it, it's hard to kind of turn that off. Yeah. The other thing is that I think it's been so beneficial. We're going way off the grid on this, but like on the zoom kind of culture and all that, I mean, you do get insight into everyone's life so i'm calling on oh, people true. now i mean their dog's back there i oh, mean yeah. they're they're in their you know whatever you see their kids running around and oh, yeah. it just is a lot more i feel like the the guard's been dropped dropped a lot. out yeah and i think there is a like in all zoom like i'm so exhausted by it now but it i think it has allowed us to 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 kind of take the facade off a little bit. Sure. Sure. So it's, been, so it's, it's healthy. It's been beneficial in I those think. client relationships. Uh, yeah. Right. That, that makes sense. Yeah. I was listening to, and I don't recall who it was, but I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about this false sense of work-life balance and that it's not really work-life balance because balance is balance, right? There's 24 hours in a day, eight hours of it. Let's say you spend sleeping or in a bed, perhaps eight hours of it. You're working maybe. Do you really have eight hours with your family in those other eight hours? Not really, right? So it's really about see the, the farmer's approach is what this podcast was talking about, taking the farmer's approach. And in different seasons throughout the year, there's work-life priorities. And so you figure out how to prioritize that intentional time with your family. It may not be balanced in, in a season of life, you might be working a little bit harder because you're launching a new business called Click Partnerships, right? Or in a season of life, maybe things are really going and you can take time away from. So I, I, it, that resonated with me when well, I was I think the encouragement I'd give on that too, especially to, to leaders is how do you integrate the family into your work? Mm. Like, how do you, I mean, you have the authority as a CEO yeah. um, to, to invite family into it i was part of a company and this was this is this is what did it for me uh, back in the sports marketing space culture amazing culture amazing but it was amazing to those who worked there it wasn't amazing to the wives of those oh. or the kids of those sure. or the husbands of those sure that's a big difference i mean if you want to attract the best talent and in in what i said i mean we worked to your point earlier we were, and we would say this all the time at Huddle. I work with you idiots more than I see my wife and kids yeah. every week. Yep. So we're going to love what we're going to do. Yeah. That's number one. And number two, how are we going to include our families in this process? Let's, that's part of life and doing life together. There's not a separation of work and that's right home yeah in many cases yeah. I and mean, there there is but there yeah but yeah no we, we I, one of my guests in a prior podcast talked about integrity and the definition of integrity like a bridge bridge integrity right the bridge is the same from start to middle to the other side of the bridge and as leaders we need to have integrity in our lives and and there, there there's really not this separation between work life and home life it's 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 an integrity across of it and how, across the, the entire bridge. And how do we, how do we keep that, you know, keep that together? So all leaders need, we talked about this on the prior podcast, all leaders need to be spoken into all leaders, all people need to be spoken into. And from the leadership perspective in you are not only in your vocation, a leader, obviously the CEO of your current company, but a community leader, Leaders, we're giving a lot out, but we need to feed our bodies and feed our minds with things. What are you doing right now? What can you share with the audience that you're doing right now and, or, or, or in this season of life that you're doing that you're feeding yourself as a leader to, to stay healthy and to grow, whether it's mentally, emotionally, what, what, what are those things that you're doing? There are three things. I mean, you are who you hang around. So that's, that's the, <laughs> that's the, the big part of it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't really realize that we had mentioned coming from a kind of a rural community, the exposure to, to different things um, wasn't always there um, just because there, there weren't a mm -hmm. lot of entrepreneurs where I was from or whatever, but being exposed to, and, and my kind of where I come from, not only an entrepreneur, um, but, but someone who has a faith ba background, uh, that's important to me too. So I have a, a small group that meets bi-weekly right now and we, we yep. study together and um, read different different things and get into each other's lives and call each other out and 
you know, I serve at my church. So as an elder, so there's training at that point as well. Yeah. But I think, man, so much of it is, is one-on-one too. I, I remember Andy Andrews, I think his name was written a bunch of books on leadership, et cetera. He's kind of old school, but he was homeless at one point. He, 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 I just remember this story. He said, the one thing I could get for free, I could go to the library and get a book. And, um, he started just gobbling up biographies mm. and found that like his mentors became those that he read about, he read about. Mm. And yeah. so I always 100% of the time have a biography going and it could be anyone from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Corey Ten Boom to, <laughs> I just finished one on Keith Richards. I mean, it's every, and you cool, can learn. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can learn and I've literally yeah. learned something from all of them and so i think there's there's the physical touch of people and and insight hey you have a life on life relationship with people that are speaking into you but also yeah that and, and biographies and and also just my, my time in scripture and the word is just so important to me and it's become more important as i've grown yeah um, for sure and it because at the end of the day that's um you know that's our eternity it's eternal that's so, eternal yeah, it has so, eternal significance. So that's, I guess, those are the best examples I can give. To no, no, that's that's I'm great. Being refreshed. So, do you have right now a motto, scripture, creed, life quote? You know, maybe it's it's something because you're reading. Obviously, you're talking about reading these biographies. You're in uh, a men's group who are keeping you accountable to things. But are there is there something right now? Uh, it could be biblical. It could be non biblical. It could be some word you got on a wall somewhere, yeah. but is there something that's like, this is resonating with me right now? Because for me, it changes. I do have, I do have one, but it changes for me throughout maybe a, a year or so. I mean, there's some things that are, that are right there forever that have eternal significance, but yeah. there are other things that are inspirational to me in seasons of life that I need that, that, uh, thing. So is there something right yeah, now? I'll give you, you a couple, you know? we three kind of things and it'll be brief, but I, I'm kind of <laughs> of the, and this is the simplicity in me, Andy Stanley would say, and I'm, I'm not quoting the paraphrasing, but when, when you're casting vision or whatever, keep, you know, and you're, you're stating that vision and, and when they got it, keep stating the vision. Right. Oh, I mean, yeah. so it's, it's the truth for me too. So brevity and clarity are really essential to me and yeah. because that's, I'm, I'm, I'm a simpleton in that regard, but I also think as Donald Miller would say, everyone learns like a third grader. Like, yeah. so when you are casting vision, do it on a third grade level or simplify selling, it. Don't overcomplicate oh, it. Keep the message succinct, right. Yes. With your team, with your client, with whatever that is. That's, that's really yeah. good. And so with great me advice. and my family, the, the three things I would say is like at 30,000 feet, Angie and I've always looked at Philippians 2, 15, which ultimately says as, as believers were to shine like stars in the universe. So we kind of have that as an overarching, but everything, I mean, I, I, we have this written in the house. We have it on our walls. We I write it in letters. Is um, and this is for my kids? Every day I tell them, I pray for them, and I tell them, honor the king. Mm. It's three words: honor mm -hmm. the king. And it's really, and I ask them, how are you going to do that? I'm going to love him. I'm going to love others. How are you going to love others? And it brings, it sparks conversation. It sure does. The king being God. Yep. So it's super simple. I I hope that they take it and take it to their family and their family to their family. It's just super simple, but it. it is why we exist. It is ultimately to honor him yeah. it, by my, my purview. Yeah. And the, and really the last thing, and, and this is, I know a lot of folks will do this. They'll be like, what do you, at the beginning of the year, what do you, what's the one word you're kind of thinking through? What, what's God put on your heart or what, what do you, and for me this year specifically, so I'll take it from 30,000 feet to 10 to what am I doing this year? Presently, and it's, yeah. It's all around uh, the word poor. How am I blessing the poor? Mm. So I'm put, trying to put wheels on. Yeah. Okay, how am I honoring the king? Well, this year, I'm really going to focus on putting on serving. The so poor. that poor, that word poor is kind of the vehicle and then how you're putting wheels on that, how you're putting an engine in that, how you're moving towards that. It could be that. financially. It could be leading my family in this way. It could be. And I'm not doing it great, but it is a, you know, it's. It's just simplifying. It's yeah. taking, digging it down to the basic. But you're level. taking actions, and that, that that's yeah. such great wisdom. Keeping it very simple, as the old saying goes, "Keep it simple, stupid." But keep that message simple, and just just 
continue to cast it and cast it again and cast it again, whether it's to yourself, whether it's to your people, whether it's to your business or whether it's to your family. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. If you could go back, let's go back in time. I was like to say, get in a DeLorean and go back in time <laughs> and go and meet with your younger self. Let's say it's 17 year old Alex, or let's say it's 22 year old Alex, but you can meet with your younger self. What kind of advice now that you've gathered all this wisdom in your journey so far at the midway point, or maybe only a third of your life, wherever you're at, right? Um, what kind of advice would you give your younger self? Like the, the you know, the saying, fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. I think that's our, our inherent position, right? As, as people, just people. You're faking it by and large. Mm -hmm. And I would probably say, and I did that and continue to do it, but it would be like, man, it's like we said in a previous podcast, to ask the question, man. It's like I'm, it's okay because that if you don't fake it, if you are just authentic, authentic. And, and you and you do share some humility with someone else, hey, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Or tell me about that or be curious about that. Yeah. It it props the other person up no and, doubt. And, it get, and it allows you to be, to it takes that, get all and it that, takes that wall down and yeah. that, in, that, that, that insecure. You're almost saying, look, I mean, you're, you're, you're eliminating your own insecurity yes. in, well, I'm not going to fake it till me. Cause I really don't even know what, yeah. what, I don't even know what she just said or he just said, right. I and don't understand I that. I find that today and by the world standards, I'm somewhat successful, but I still find I'm so insecure. Yeah, me too. And yeah. if, if I would just just put park that right here mm. and just say, you know, I don't know. You tell me, I, I I wasn't good at this. What what is it like? Instead of trying to be something, I'm just not. So I would tell my younger person that, but I'm telling myself that too today. Yeah, that's so good. it's a, it's a you know yeah that's yeah. good. Well, of course you're going to tell your younger. I mean, because you <laughs> yeah. you're, that's truth in your life right now, right? right. And so that's what you've learned. All right. So fun question when, when it's all said and done and we're at the end of your life and everything, everyone's reflecting back on Alex Q and the legacy that he's left behind. What, what do you hope the books say about you? Well, I don't know that anyone's going to write a book, but like, I guess at my, don't uh, sell yourself at my short. Funeral, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want to read it. I'm curious <laughs> to see what it would say. I want, I mean, it's super simple, but I want them to know I loved well. Like I, I really loved them and, um, that person and, um, and ultimately that stems from my love for God. And I, it's so frustrating because I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you, uh, we did this in an exercise with, with some guys I was leading years ago and wrote my eulogy. Boy, that's a, that's a convicting thing. Oh yeah. Uh, what you want it to be versus what it probably oh, I just talked about that last night with my wife oh, on the couch. Gosh. Well. Well, that, that was it. I remember that being, man, I just like, if, if someone, if they could say about me, man, he really loved the Lord. And he, as a result, he really liked me mm. and, uh, and didn't matter where I was socioeconomically or racially or uh, politically. Yeah. I mean, all these dividing mm. points, yeah. um, it really does just come down to that. I mean, it's not like, I mean, I don't know that. That's Again, your, that's I'm your, a simple that's man. your, that's your, that's your, <laughs> that's your word of the lifetime love, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, poor is your word of the year that you've been meditating on. Love is your, your, your word of the lifetime. Yeah. So yep. Alex Q, love you, man. You too, buddy. You're Thanks. an awesome leader. You're an awesome leader of a fan of your family an awesome leader of men and women. Mm -hmm. And I just appreciate you. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing wisdom with our, with our audience. It's been uh, sincerely a joy. Oh, so same here, buddy. Thanks. To all of our listeners out in podcast land, thanks again for tuning in. I hope uh, today's episode was both empowering and inspirational. Until next time, I hope your daily journeys are filled with opportunity to lift others up as we aim to go above and beyond. Thanks, everybody. Our executive producer and host is Matt Maloney, president and CEO of FAM360. Strategic communication coordinator, Michelle Decato. Production assistance by Tin Dog Studios. Director, John Berland. Creative assistant, Whitney Roland. Theme song, Connecting Dots by Curtis Cole, provided by Artlist. Please subscribe today and don't miss any of our weekly episodes.